Well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to talk about today. So I'm Jeff Shapiro from Linux Foundation, and this is Gary O'Neill, Source Auditor, but you guys may know me from SPDX. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. So uh, we're going to be talking about SBOMs today. And I know there have been a number of sessions about SBOMs, and maybe some of you have already seen some of them. Maybe you haven't. Our goal is to give you a primer, to give you enough information so that you understand how to read an SBOM, use an SBOM, and generate an SBOM. So these are two definitions that we chose, um, which I think give a good, really good uh, description or summary of what an SBOM is. So NTIA is the National Telecommunication, Telecommunications Information Administration. It's one of the government agencies that's creating the, uh, the, one of the specifications for SBOMs uh, based on the new mandate to supply SBOMs to the federal government. They say, and I agree, a, a software bill of materials is a nested inventory. It's a list of ingredients. So it really is a, exactly what, what it says. Just it's, it's a list of everything that goes into your application, your package, your service. Uh, Gartner, who does a lot of research, um, says, SBOMs improve visibility, transparency, security, and integrity um, in, of all the software in your supply chain. And all of those things are important. Um, SBOMs, it, SBOMs should be human readable, but they have to be machine readable. If they're not machine readable, they're not very useful because we use tools, generally we use tools to generate and consume SBOMs. They give a list of your components and dependencies. These can include source files, packages, libraries, binaries, um, things that you can put into a container. Essentially, anything that can make up a software system can and should be in your SBOM. It includes some basic and vital component information, such as the author of the package, uh, the name, the version, enough information that you can identify where it comes from and you can get provenance information about that component. It's important to note that the components that are in your SBOM can be open source, closed source, proprietary, for internal use. They can be you know, written in-house. They can be um, acquired from, from anywhere in the world. So why are SBOMs important? So we talk a lot about security vulnerabilities. You've heard not just with SBOMs, but in general, why you know, uh, supply chain security um, and checking for vulnerabilities and, um, is, is critical. License compliance is actually one of the main reasons why SBOMs were originally developed many years ago. Uh, maintainability, we talk about uh, provenance, about where your software comes from. Uh, reproducing builds, et cetera, and new in the last couple of years is government policy. So security vulnerabilities, you want to be able to track vulnerabilities, you want to know if they exist on your system. License compliance is, is, has always been important regarding knowing which licenses apply and finding any license conflicts. Um, and just to repeat, maintainability, is really about increasing the reliability and reproducibility of your, of your builds. And now the government says, if you want to deal with us, you've got to supply SBOMs, so there you go. Now, it's not just about supplying them, but hopefully they're using them too. That's another matter. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the standard formats that are out there. Um, you know, uh, there's actually uh, three standards that the NTIA mentions in their document. It'd be nice if there was only one, but uh, as with many standards, you know, there's many to choose from. Uh, you know, what's important is that you use one of the standards. Now, um, I'll go through these three, but I, I will say that there is some collaboration going on across these different standards. I work with people from uh, OWASP and the Cyclone DX community to try to make sure we can do round trips and write tools to be able to translate between them. So it's not as bad as you think, because there is some collaboration going on, but these are the three choices you have. I'm, I'm involved in the SPDX community. It's an ISO standard. 
Uh, we're working on 3.0. It's a very large community. We support a large number of use cases that are out there and also a lot of file formats. So there's the standard, the vocabulary, and then there's the different file formats that are supported. So we support everything from a simple tag value format to RDF XML, even a spreadsheet, which the lawyers love to consume spreadsheets as their, uh, as their standard formats. Uh, Cyclone DX is from the security community. They're pretty focused on the security use cases. Uh, they support JSON, XML, and protocol buffers as the file formats. And then SWID is a NIST uh, standard that uh, focuses on software identification. So um, let's talk a little bit. What I want to do in this talk is get right, you know, kind of get right down into the details. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from the uh, community that says SBOMS is too hard. There's too many fields. I'm looking at the spec. I got to fill all this stuff in. It's not that bad. If you want to just do the minimum amount, it's actually pretty darn simple. And I'm going to go in and show you some examples of exactly what that looks like. So this is from the NTIA. It's the minimum SBOM for it to be a viable SBOM to be used. Uh, so these are, the, uh, these are the things you need to have. So the supplier name, who is supplying you the component? Now, I want to separate out the supplier of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the SBOM itself from the supplier of the component that the SBOM describes. So the supplier is the supplier of the component that's being described by the SBOM. Then, of course, you want to know the name of the component. It's important to know the version because you've got to be very specific. And this one, the other unique identifiers, this is uh, if you've heard of package URLs or CVEs, there's lots of ways to identify it. This is critically important for being able to correlate it to databases like vulnerability databases and satisfy the uh, security use cases. Uh, I would encourage you to use as many identifiers as you can find because uh, one database might you know, recognize a CVE, another may recognize a PERL. If you put both those in the SBOM, you stand a much better chance of being able to uh, find your vulnerabilities. Dependency relationships, you need to know what are the dependent packages and how they're related. And then you have the author of the SBOM data itself. And then when was the SBOM created? So basically being able to track information about the SBOM. Now, Jeff and I would like to recommend a couple of additional fields beyond the minimum. Um, one is some way of, uh, of verifying the component, a hash, or some mechanism to be able to know that you can, you can look at your component and say, yes, that's the same thing that's described in the SBOM. Download location, uh, where did they actually get it from? Again, that's helpful to be able to go in and verify that it's the right thing. And then license information. So beyond the identification of the package, what is the license? Communicating that can be really, really helpful to your downstream users. So I'm going to go in and give a little demo of uh, exactly what's in an SBOM. And I'm just going to do a minimum uh, SBOM. This here is just the structure. You'll see this in the code in just a minute. But uh, at the very top is the creation information about the document. Uh, the package information, file information, and the relationships. So with that, I'm just going to switch over. While, while Gary is switching, I want to mention we will be posting these slides on the Sketch website after the talk, so uh, you guys can go there and download them. I noticed people taking a few snapshots. Uh, there's a reason that you've seen these, um, these tables again and again and again in all the sessions here uh, at Open Source Summit just because they come from the NTIA. And um, so it is the government specification, and that's why, that's why we're all talking about it. Yep. Good. All right. So here, here's, this is a complete SBOM. This is all you need to do to satisfy the minimum. It's 38 lines. Sorry, uh, question? question? It, yeah. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, can we make the font a little bigger? I'll see if it's not as easy as you would think, but I will try to do that quickly. Let's see. And it's a few clicks away. Give me just a second. I'm almost there. It's Eclipse. There's a lot of options. <laughs> <laughs> OK, see, that's 12. Let's try bumping it up one. There, how's that? Oops. I just got to get rid of the dialogue, and then we're back. All right. So um, we mentioned the, uh, the document information. That's this part of it right here. And I'm just going to go through what all these different fields are. It's a little hard to drag well, without my mouse. There we go. Um, the first thing, the SPDX ID, that's just the identity. By the way, I'm going to be using SPDX JSON as uh, the example, because I know SPDX the best, being part of that community. 
Uh, JSON is probably, it's, if it isn't already, it is quickly becoming the most popular format that's being used for SPDX. So, um, and this was all handwritten by me, uh, so it's not really that hard to, uh, to build one of these things. Just oh, and we will be posting these uh, samples on GitHub as well. Right, so you can go take a look at the examples later. So in the creation information, we have an identifier for the, for the document itself, and that's just a, uh, it's always SPDX test document. It's important to know what the version of the spec is so that you can validate against it. So we got the SPDX version. And then here's the creation information. This is the author of the SBOM, that NTIA minimum requirement. So you got the timestamp, and you can see it was created by me. Uh, the uh, name of the SBOM itself, so it's not the name of the package or the component, it's the name of the SBOM. We also would like to communicate the license of the SBOM itself. So that's the data license, that's the license of the SBOM. Uh, so if you're giving it to somebody else, they can quickly see what it's licensed under, license of the data. Uh, and then this document namespace is a unique identifier so that if you get an SPDX document, you can look at this and make sure that that's exactly the one that you're looking for. So if you're referencing an SPDX document someplace else, you can use this as a globally unique, guaranteed, uh, unique identifier. So that's the, pack, that's the, uh, the information about the SBOM itself. And then on the packages... Uh, information here. So this is the information about the component. And uh, it's got an ID. The ID just has to be unique within the, within the SPDX document. It's got a name, again, one of the minimum requirements. The supplier, one of the minimum requirements, who supplied it. In this case, I'm using as an example one of the tools that I maintain, which is the Java tools within SPDX. So the organization that supplies it is SPDX. A little confusing because it's an SPDX document. Don't be confused by that. That's also it just happens to be the supplier here. Um, the package file name, which is the file name that's actually downloaded. And then this is the verification information I mentioned that would be uh, useful uh, as additional information. So that's the checksum of the package itself, the download location where I got it from, and then these external refs, these are the other identifiers that we can use to correlate to the databases. So in this case, I used a package URL. And then there's one other key piece of information that we need, which is there's the package, but in many cases, you have a document that has hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of packages. What's the top? What's the root of the SBOM that I'm interested in? Um, so we need a way to say this document is describing this package. And we do that through relationships. So the relationship here just says that the SPDX ref document describes the SPDX package. And that's all we need. Uh, and you know, now that we have this, we can actually just go into the uh, uh, we can actually go into the online tool and just see if we if this actually does uh, validate. And sorry, I thought I had this at the right location. So uh, we have this online tool, um, which is uh, which you can get to at tools.spdx.org. And you can just drop the, uh, the SBOM into it. And let's just do a, we tell it as JSON. Validate. And we see that it's valid. Now, it's a valid SPDX document, but it, is a, it doesn't meet the minimum requirements. There's another little feature on the tool here, which is the NTIA conformance checker. And this will actually go through every one of the different uh, uh, packages that are described and check every one of them to make sure they meet the uh, the minimum requirements. So if we do that, drag that over, and it's valid. So um, that's it. There, there you have a minimum mess bomb. So if you're a maintainer of an open source package, that's all you need to do. If you do that, a lot of us will be happy because now we got high fidelity information that we can bring into our project. So when we send downstream, you know, information, we can include the information that you wanted in the SBOM very precisely and very accurately. That's all you need to do. But you can do more, which we'll be getting into next. Uh, let's see here. And let me just mention that while Gary wrote this SBOM by hand, just typing it in to demonstrate how simple it is, typically you'll be using tools. Of course, if you have a large software system with hundreds or thousands of components, you're going to use tools. And we'll talk about those too. And there are tools available to generate your SBOMs. 
So a number of you have seen this diagram before. This is the software life cycle. Again, this comes from the NTIA. Um, I did not write this myself. And this is not to demonstrate the complexity of SBOMs. This is to demonstrate the complexity of software life cycle. So there are many phases in the software life cycle. And the, the main point that I want to make here is people think, well, when do I use an SBOM? Or more importantly, when do I generate an SBOM? <clears throat> and the reality is any single, a, any, anywhere on this software life cycle is a, is a, is a valid place to use or generate your SBOM. So I want to talk a little bit about internal versus external use. A lot of people think, OK, I want an SBOM so that um, I'm writing an open source package or component, and I want to generate an SBOM to help my downstream users. First of all, thank you. That's what we want you to do. Um, a lot of people think, OK, I want an internal SBOM because I'm a corporate enterprise and I want to track vulnerabilities. I want to make sure that I'm you know, uh, up, up on license compliance. Uh, that is an extremely common use case. Um, both are important. If you want to generate one SBOM, great. If you need to generate an internal one and you don't want to share that information with anybody outside your organization for uh, confidentiality proprietary reasons, that's fine. Just be sure you're generating an external SBOM for anybody that's consuming, consuming your software. So the generation itself, as I said, that you can generate an SBOM just about anywhere on the software lifecycle. Two of the more common times to generate an SBOM are during development when you are writing all of your source code. There are lots of tools out there, the, the SCA tools, that scan source code repositories and they will generate an SBOM based on all of your source code. Um, there are also tools out there that are uh, CI, CD tools that you run when you're doing your build that will generate um, SBOMs based on your build. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, doing it during the build is usually a, a great time to do it. Um, it's important to know that you know, sometimes, you know, hopefully, someday, everybody will be generating SBOMs and you will never need to generate an SBOM for somebody else's software because they will do it themselves for you. That's ideal. And then you'll just be a consumer. You'll generate your own SBOM for your own software that, you're, that you are writing and you will make use of the SBOMs that everybody else gives you with all the components that you're, that you're getting from everywhere else. But I, unfortunately, that's not the way it is today. So there are times when you need to generate an SBOM for things that you receive that don't have them. And that can be tricky. Um, I believe you're up. Yeah, I think there's one slide. Did we miss right? something? Oh. Oh. OK. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, yeah, I think we're missing a slide there, uh, but that's okay. I can wave my hands a little to make up for it. Um, the, uh, let's talk a little bit about the tooling. It's actually my favorite topic. I love writing tools. I use tools. And uh, first thing I just wanted to mention is that, the, uh, the, as, as Jeff mentioned, the build tools is the ideal place because it's got visibility of all the code coming in. And it's got visibility about what's being produced. So it, it's the best place to be able to generate tooling. And uh, uh, there's a few tools out there that can help, um, both in, in uh, SPDX and some of the other standards. You'll find a lot of tooling that plugs right into the build environments that's there. So uh, within the SPDX community, we have a Maven. If you're part of the uh, Java Maven community, we've got a plugin for that. We've got a plugin for Gradle that's just about out. Uh, SIFT has a GitHub action and a tool that's out there for generating that. And we have an SBOM generator that the SPDX community supports that covers a lot of different build environments as well. So uh, that's the ideal place to be able to put it. Um, but uh, what do you do if you get software that doesn't have an SBOM? Now, now it gets a little bit more challenging because you got to dig into the code and try to find out what's going on. So we're, we kind of break the tools down into three different areas. Um, 
there's tools that look at the build metadata. So these aren't the build tools. You're not doing it at build time, you're doing it afterwards. But perhaps the, the, the code that you're bringing in has some of those build artifacts, the Maven POM files, the Gradle files, you know, the, uh, the Python uh, build files or make files, CMake files, whatever they are. There's a lot of tools out there that'll look at that build data. And what they're really good for is finding the dependency information that's there. They're not so good at looking at the source files typically, but, but they're very, very useful um, and typically pretty easy to run and reasonably accurate. Then there's uh, uh, scanners that look at, at the file level and search for strings. Most of these are used for doing license analysis. They don't typically identify the actual packages and package versions, uh, but for doing the license portion of SBOMs, they actually do a pretty good job, and uh, there's a few good tools out there for doing that. And then this last section is what we're calling the source snippet scanner. So these are tools that actually inventory a huge database of available known open source files and can actually look at the code that, you know, the, inspect the code that you're bringing in, compare it to their database, and they'll try to tell you uh, exactly what version and what package. And so from that, you can actually pick up some of the other important metadata and be able to bring that into the SBOM. The problem with these snippet scanners is there's a bunch of false positives. So in some cases, you know, you might get two or 300 possible matches because not only is it finding the actual code that, that it actually is, but it's finding the code in other dependencies and you know, it's imported into other projects. So um, these typically require a human to be able to go in and look at the results to find out exactly which one it is. By the way, I heard a talk earlier that said it's impossible to find what the root version. That's not impossible. That's what I do for my day job is I can look, in fact, I've done this so much, I can look at like a list of three, these 300, oh, I know what that is. You know, I've done this so many times. So it is possible to do it, but it's, it's, uh, it does require humans. Um, so a little bit more involved, a little bit more expensive. So this is just a few examples. Um, you know, within um, our community, the Open Source Review Toolkit, ORT, is uh, something that looks at uh, some of the build metadata. Uh, the Open SBOM Generator, SIF, Sneak, uh, there's, there's quite a few others. And if, if you have a favorite tool that does this, it's not up here, my apologies. I'm just giving you just a few examples that's out there. Uh, source License Scanner, uh, there's a number of open source tools that are out there. Fossology is probably the original one written many years ago. Uh, Scan Code Toolkit is another one that's widely used. And then the uh, Source Snippet Scanner, most of these, not all, but most of these are actually commercial tools because it does take quite a bit to be able to scan and maintain a large database. So there's a few examples of that. So it's also worth noting about the tools that today, these tools are excellent, both the commercial and open source tools. But in my experience, most of these tools are really good at one of the one or two of these things, but not all of them. I think that we're still waiting for some of the tools to be good at doing everything. And a perfect example of that is source versus dependencies. You hear people talking about scanning source code for license compliance, um, for vulnerabilities, um, scanning, no, I won't get into the details, but you, know, you can scan source code for, for actual vulnerabilities in your code, which is different than scanning dependencies for known vulnerabilities. The source scanners that check for vulnerabilities are, if they're sophisticated enough, they're actually finding flaws in your known or, or common flaws in your source code, but these are not CVEs that are already out there in the database. Um, so we scan source code. Uh, we, we scan dependencies for all of your third-party dependencies, all you know, as, as deep as you can go uh, in your dependency tree. Um, the point I want to make here is that to get a complete, for an SBOM, to get a complete picture of what is in your system, you really need both. So just doing source or just doing dependencies isn't good enough. Because, let's face it, engineers copy and paste source code and they plop that source code into their repository. So you've got com third party components in your source code repository that you're compiling, linking, building into your packages. And then you've got binaries, libraries, artifacts, et cetera. So to get a really complete SBOM, you need both. 
So um, let's talk a little about how this relates back to SBOMs. So you've scanned your source, you capture that, you want to include that in the SBOM itself. So how, how does that actually work? Uh, I'm just going to go back and give you a quick example of that and uh, switch over to an SBOM with source. So um, it has the same package information we had before, so I'm not going to go through that. Basically, what we do is we just add in a file section. So every file that you identify, by the way, these can get quite large, you know, you can imagine with a lot of source files, but each one has an ID, again, it's unique within the document. You have a checksum for it so that you can do the validation on it, and then, um, uh, and then the name of the file, and that's basically it. Now there's a couple other things that we need to do. We need to be able to tie the source file to the package. It does no good to know that these source files are laying out there. You really want to know these source files belong to the package. So again, we go back to the relationship. We have the, uh, we, we still have the SPDX document relationship from before, but now we have the, S, the SPDX package contains the SPDX file, and that's how we do that. Now there's one other thing I'll just point out briefly, is within the package, sometimes it's really convenient to be able to know that, uh, that you know, to be able to validate all of these files really came from you know, that, that package that the contains is really right. So we got a little algorithm of doing checksums of checksums essentially to generate this thing called a package verification code. And uh, you can add that into the package if you like, the package metadata. And basically what that lets you do is if you, if you calculate this based on the source files you have, you get one number, you look in the SBOM, oh, it's the same number, okay, it's valid, I can move on. Saves a little bit of time. So I think the, uh, the next thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the dependencies. So now we collected these dependencies. How does the dependencies look within the uh, SPDX or, or SBOM files? So, um, so if we go back to the packages, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we already went through what the packages look like, so we're just adding another package. Now, uh, I gotta give you a little bit of a caveat, and you'll understand why in a second. Uh, this is made up. Um, SPDX tools, the, the thing that I maintain, does not contain this component. And you'll know why this is important in just a minute. Uh, but I just, I just threw that in there as an example of a dependency. So it's got some of the same information from before. And again, we go back to the relationships, and we're gonna say that the, the package that this SBOM is describing is dynamically linked to this uh, SPDX ref. Now, one thing we can do now that we have this information with the metadata, and by the way, I have the package URL of this as well, of the, of the dependent package, we can actually go in and start running, uh, running this against some tools. And uh, there's a tool that, uh, that we worked out called the SPDX to OSV, and it basically just takes an SBOM and it goes and queries the open source vulnerability database. I believe Google maintains that and, uh, and generates an output. So I'm just gonna run that quickly. This is my one dependent on the, uh, on the internet, so I'm always a little nervous about this part of the demo. <laughs> Looks like it worked, okay. Now, if I, uh, if I just uh, take a look at it, it's like, oh dear, something came back. If there's no vulnerabilities, it's an empty file, that's a good thing, but oh my. Looks like that dependent package has some kind of a vulnerability in it. So, uh, so now we know, we got something to worry about. So th this is just a little bit of a demonstration on the security side of it, of the usefulness of being able to collect those external references and the uh, dependent relationships. And let me go back to the presentation. So um, talking about security, you know, this is one of the most important use cases that's out there. Um, you know, we, I've already talked about how we use it to correlate with the vulnerability databases. The more external references, the, the better. I've said that three times. I'm probably going to say it three more times because I think it's the most important thing to keep in mind if you're generating SBOMs. Uh, use those external references. And I just wanted to point out, you know, if you're, if you're interested in other uh, security use cases, we got a really nice uh, how-to guide that's actually part of our specifications. So um, now I, I just want to give you an example of, so we found a vulnerability. What if you want to communicate that to your downstream users, which is kind of convenient to include in the, uh, in the SPDX file. Uh, I'll just show you how that's done. 
And by the way, these are all SPDX 2.3 uh, versions. So this is all using the, uh, the current spec that's out there. So we talked about these uh, external references, you know, the package URLs and that. We have a category of external references called security. And we have a number of different types of security information that you can actually include in this. So basically what we do is just add another external reference. We say that it's a security type. And in this case, I just took the, uh, the CVE that, uh, that came out of the OSV and just included that in the SBOM. Now, when your customers get your SBOM, your users or downstream users, uh, they can look that up and know that that vulnerability is there. In 3.0, by the way, uh, we're really extending that, and uh, uh, there's a lot of work, I, I see it alpha over there, uh, being done on uh, VEX, which actually lets you describe whether your software is actually vulnerable or not, or whether you're impacted or not by these vulnerabilities, which would be quite useful. So the other really common use case for SBOMs that we've talked about a few times is licenses. Um, a license can apply to a code snippet, which is a, a, a fragment, like a co you copy and pasted something from somewhere. It can apply to a single source file, an entire library, or everything in an entire container. So um, licensing is, is complex, and we're not going to go into details about licensing, but it's important to know that you need license information to make sure that you're not risking your, 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 your intellectual property. So what we want to point out here is that uh, the SPDX spec in particular has um, two different classifications of licenses for the packages and components in your SBOM. There is the declared license, which is sometimes uh, people talk about it as the detected license. That is specified by the author of the package. So that is whoever, whoever provides that package or component to you says this is the license. Often these are found by, by scanning tools. And then there is the concluded license. The concluded license is the license that the person who, or tool, the author of the SBOM itself, says I'm using these components and this is the license that I believe applies to this component in the SBOM that I just generated. Now why are these different? Well, usually they're the same. Usually they, they aren't different. But the important thing is sometimes a component, probably the simplest use case is you get, you get jQuery from out, from, the, from out there on the internet and you're using it in your system and jQuery is dual licensed under MIT or GPL and you say, oh, I'm going to choose the MIT license. So the declared license might be MIT or GPL, and your concluded license is MIT because I choose to use it under MIT. So that's just one example, but um, they're, all, they're typically the same, but they can be different. And I just want to make a plug here for SPDX license identifiers. These are not in the SBOM. These are in your code but they're used by tools to make sure that the licensing information in your SBOM is accurate. So these SPDX license identifiers are machine readable. Please put them in all of your source code, every single source file, every file header, and your SBOMs and everyone else's will be much more accurate when it comes to license data. So now let's see what licenses look like in SBOMs. So going back to the, whoops. I think I missed it. There we go. Going back to the, and this will be my last detail. You're probably getting tired of seeing these, uh, these very detailed ones, uh, but uh, this will be your last one. Um, so there's, there's these, the, the concluded and declared licenses apply to both at the package level and at the file level. So uh, within the package, uh, the package information, I think I got to scroll down a little here you'll see these new fields. There's your license concluded and the license declared uh, that, that Jeff just, just described. There's also a little bit of a shorthand uh, little convenience uh, field, license information and file. Many times uh, when you're, you know, when you're uh, going through a compliance process, uh, they'll want to know what are all the licenses that you found in the files themselves as an extra check. So you can actually put those into a nice little array or list there and include that in the package. And then in the files, we see the same uh, information, uh, the license concluded, and uh, the declared license is called license info and files in here as well, but that's, the, uh, that's actually the declared license that's there. 
So uh, that's pretty much it as far as the uh, as far as passing along the license information uh, within the uh, within the document. Let me switch back to the presentation. So um, so that's it. That's it. That's the last example. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, listening through all the all the gory details. But I'm hoping that by going through the details, you can see that it's really not that hard. You don't have to have lots and lots of fields to build an effective SBOM that'll help your downstream consumers. Um, in terms of what's next, we're very busy on SPDX 3.0. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're building uh, some additional what we're calling profiles uh, for the actual, you know, being able to track the provenance of the actual build of the software, and uh, also another profile for how the software is actually used. And, and that's important in areas like safety, where you want to be able to communicate um, this software is only valid until this particular date. After that date, it's no longer supported, so you should upgrade. So information like that. I think one of the most interesting ones is the uh, SBOM for AI. I, there is just so much going on in that field, uh, and the team has done, I, I think, just a great job of capturing what kind of information should be communicated about AI. And, uh, and when you get into AI, of course, there's a lot of data that's associated with AI. So we have a profile specific to the data that's uh, available as well. And then the, the other area that we're working on, we just spun up a group to look at the SBOMs for software as a service. So this is being able to represent service information. So if you're going out on the internet to acquire a service, what would be the SBOM equivalent? Although SBOM in this case may be uh, service bill of materials as opposed to software. <laughs> so that's the future. So, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, first, Start using SBOMs today. And, and if, you're, if you're getting SBOMs from your customers, don't just put them on the disk. Actually use it to find vulnerabilities. Use it to validate uh, that the license information. And also use it to make sure you actually got the software that they think they gave you as well. So there's a lot of uses for SBOMs you can have today. Ask for SBOMs from your suppliers. You know, even if you're an open source user, Ask for it for your, uh, from any of your dependencies that are there. And uh, join an SBOM community. CISA, SPDX, we're a very open and welcoming society of, uh, of like-minded individuals. So you guys, you know, all of you are, are welcome to come join our uh, community. And uh, OpenSSF has an SBOM Everywhere uh, program that uh, would be uh, glad to get some additional help. So uh, that's it. Uh, I think we have two minutes for questions. Yeah, so uh, these are some additional resources. Um, the government specs, um, um, some of our SPDX specs um, and, and descriptions, uh, the tools that we showed you and more. Um, there's a great research report from our Linux Foundation Research Group on SBOMs and cybersecurity that I encourage everybody to take a look at. Uh, as I said, we'll post these slides um, to the Skedge website so you, um, um, right after so that you guys don't have to worry about writing all this down now. Uh, questions, please. Go ahead. Um, oh. I saw that you guys are starting to work on SPDX for software as a service. Um, there. At the... there you go. Uh, I saw you guys are working on SPDX for software as a service. Would, that, uh, would blockchain fall under that or would you guys be adding a category for that? That's, it doesn't fall under that blockchain currently. Well, I, I shouldn't say it doesn't. We don't know yet. You know, it could fall into it in the future. We're just getting started. But, right. but, but in terms of like, uh, you, there's, there's actually, uh, there was a proposal five years ago to use uh, Hyperledger and blockchain for certifying SBOMs that Mark Giese put together. I still think it's a very cool and great idea, but it never really took off. It might have been a little ahead of its time. Right. But, but it's I'd, I'd like to follow up on that. And, um, it was too early. It was yeah. too early. It was the open chain, the beginning of the open chain. And the yes. Open chain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's very interesting stuff, though. So one of the things that I think is a, is a, is a concern is that in some cases we might have an implosion between all of the SBOMs for AI, cybersecurity, and blockchain. Um, we're actually talking about adding metaverses and other, uh, you know, simulation type environments that that produce massive amounts of da data, which then can make massively smarter AI. Um, I think at some point 
you know, just the, the hashes that are used to secure the S-bombs itself can be under fire, and we should start thinking about layers of post-quantum cryptography uh, mm. in here, because um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to put, you know, any menacing vibes out there, but it's, it, it'd be easy to overwrite. And if mm. there isn't a way of, of representing that my version of these S-bombs hasn't changed underneath in, you know, three different minor revisions that nobody really paid attention to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could see a, 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 a something happening there, uh, but I would definitely recommend blockchain s bombs because I feel like a lot of the the science is missing <laughs> behind the the reasons for putting some of these tools together. And I think yeah. specifically for AI, uh, this is probably your only defense uh, for enforcing ethical uh, standards. So I, I agree with everything you said. I would welcome contributions along those lines too. I, I think there's a lot of really interesting work that could be done there. And, and, and I think it's important as well. Uh, other questions? Back here. Thanks. Good question. Um, so you mentioned that uh, there are tools going one way, uh, generating from source code the as bombs and uh, from make files and whatnot. Is, are there any tools going the other way around, where you define everything in as bomb and then just generate the infrastructure for you know the builds and stuff like that? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, I, um, I don't. I don't have an answer, but uh, I, I, I don't. I don't yeah. know of any personally. Yeah. But uh, so, so basically, that's an, uh, it's most of the open source tools that are doing something cataloging like SW. Uh, like SW360 or Foslite, they actually do in this process in the other way around. They import the S bombs there to actually catalog the entire project and produce the resulting S bombs with the other curated data. It's just this is born in some way because normally companies have suppliers, suppliers don't provide to you the source code to be analyzed. They provided the resulting S bomb from their product. So you need to some way catalog in your things. So there are tools mostly, at least mostly open source, that do this process right now. It's not, it's, uh, we are a bit far to be completely ready for that, but it's pretty good. Uh, the, the latest work for my side in the case of SW360 comes from Toshiba. It's been merged right now, so you can fully integrate an S1 coming outside and create the entire part of the project. Yeah, and Foslight was another one we saw a demo yeah. of yesterday. Um, I, I'll mention one that another one that is just really simple is uh, there's a SPDX converter tool that's in that online tool I was giving a demo of earlier. You can convert it to a spreadsheet. And that can be really useful because looking at JSON doesn't work for lawyers, but they love the spreadsheets. So that's another tool you can a use. A question in the back here. Thank you. Um, it, it's interesting to see that uh, you're looking at um, S-bombs for AI, S-bombs for data. It actually uh, is very similar to an effort that's going on in the U.S. Department of Defense called the Extensible Bill of Materials, which actually seems very similar. They're at, talking about uh, d data bombs and AI bombs and a lot of other types of things. Uh, I, I was wondering if you're aware of that. If not, there might be some s synchronization there. Yeah. I, I, do you know, uh, Karen? Uh, I'm not on the uh, in those working group that I see, Karen. If you don't mind me picking on you, Karen. I'm, I'm aware of it and watch them, um, but having some kind of collaboration or synching would be great. Um, so yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's uh, maybe talk after this. Yeah, and, and I'm certainly aware of the extensible uh, bomb, and you know, and you know, there's hardware bombs. There's you know, and the fact that you know, there's there were earlier sessions. Um, here in Vancouver about you know the about those and um, about the fact that some bombs can some components can be in multiple bombs right you could have things that that are shared between different types of, of, of bills of materials so um, I mean we are certainly focusing on s bombs as in software bills of materials you know in in our discussion here but yes of course all of those are, are very important as well uh, other questions? Maybe one more question. Anybody up here? Yeah, go ahead. Here you go. Oh, sorry. So more is this more about logistics? So if um, where should S bombs be housed? And uh, if I find uh, some error in an S bomb, how do I go about reporting it? Yes, both good questions. I'll take the easy one, the second one first. That's why we have the uh, creation information in the S bomb. So if there's an error. 
you know, you look up the creator of the S-bomb and it should have enough information that you can trace it back and contact them and let them know that, that there's an error. But I've noticed Apache Group is actually in their GitHub have a specific place that for for S bombs they're actually starting to put it so that you know somebody yeah. a consumer like myself knows immediately where to go to find the S bomb for that software. Yep, and I that, would that encourage that's it. that's the the more challenging one because you know we're I, I have a I have an opinion of where I think they should be stored. Uh, well, my, let's let's hear your opinion, so Gary. I'll give you my opinion. Is there's already a place for the artifacts for the the packages are stored. So npm has a repository. Uh, Maven has a repository. Just put the S bomb right next to it. So when I download the artifact, I can download the S bomb. And the, if you do the verification information that we recommend, you can make sure you got the right stuff together, right? And then you know you can uh, put checksums on the S bomb too. It all works great. Um, there's definitely other opinions that we should have like a massive repository, like maybe the Linux Foundation should should host a big massive repository where everybody can check in. Osado does one called Ocelot. They are doing S bombs for every single comp uh, open source component. It's in a Git based repository today. This project is alive already today. So they are cataloging all the open source softwares with S bombs and for all the core products. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a there's a lot of different approaches to it. Unfortunately there was a lot of different approaches. So there's not <laughs> one consistent approach. So very good question. Yeah. I, I oh. to combine the blockchain idea. Yeah, with, uh, very related. And uh, I all right, uh, we're already a little over time. Thank you very much, everybody. Right. If uh, there are more questions after, come up and see Gary and I or outside. Thanks. Thank you.